How would I fight a T-72? I had a viewer ask a pretty interesting question. A new NATO IFV or APC with an autocannon encounters a T-72 or T-64 at a few hundred meters, but unseen. Does it? One, skedaddle. Two, lay optics and range finders onto the turret. Three, lay onto the tracks. Four, quietly spot artillery. Or five, drop troops and engage end laws. Now, this is a dog's breakfast of a question because there's really no simple answer. Now, to start, Hi, YouTube manual reviewer. All footage shown in this footage is training footage. No combat footage is shown. So, suddenly encountering the enemy is something called a meeting engagement. It's probably one of the most difficult things to do on the battlefield, mainly because it's unplanned. Attack and defense are easy. Usually you have a plan in place. Think of John Wick. When the bad guys came to John Wick's house, that was a defense, and he had a plan. When John Wick wiped out the Russian nightclub, that was an attack, and he had a plan. But when he fought Cassian in the subway station, that was a meeting engagement. Usually the person who detects the bad guy first has the advantage, but neither side has a plan. They're just making it up as they go along. This is why training is so important. You and your crew need to be able to execute actions on contact without even thinking. This is also why sensors like thermal sights are so important. If you can detect the adversary first, you can get inside of their decision loop and have them react to you. So to break this question down, the T-72 is Russia's most numerous battle tank, and the T-64 is actually a Ukrainian tank since Russia scrapped most of their 64s, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility that Russia might be operating one, maybe one that was captured, or I don't know, it doesn't matter. All that really matters is that I've identified a tank, and I'm in an IFV, which is not a tank. Now, an IFV is an infantry fighting vehicle. It normally has an autocannon, 25mm, 30mm. Sometimes it has a missile launcher, and it usually has a squad of infantry in the back, about seven to eight soldiers. So the odds of me being alone is almost zero, and the odds of some enemy tank being alone is almost the same. Russian tank platoons usually operate in groups of three, so if I see a single Russian tank, I'm going to assume his friends are nearby. This is a very dangerous situation, and IFV might be able to take on an enemy tank with its auto cannon from the rear or the sides. If it has a missile launcher, that could even the odds. It could take on one tank, but I don't think I could take on three. Now, what happens next depends on MET-T, and sometimes you hear this called MET-TC. The MET-T acronym stands for Mission, Enemy, Terrain, Troops Available, and time. And sometimes people add a C on there for civilian considerations for MET TC. Now I'm going to show you a great army trick. If an officer ever asks you a tactical question and you don't know the answer, you can buy some time by saying, well, sir, that's, uh, that's MET T dependent. <laughs> because number one, you're not wrong. And number two, if you're lucky, the officer will agree with you and then go ask somebody else. This, by the way, is how I did 20 years in the military and never got a single promote ahead of peers on my NCOER, but in all seriousness, MET-T dictates. So, how would you take MET-T into consideration? Let's start with mission. The Army does not operate in a vacuum. What are you supposed to be doing? If the mission doesn't involve taking out this enemy vehicle, maybe you should just call it up and pass the information on of the tank's location. You might hear over the radio, oh yeah, Delta Company found that tank abandoned an hour ago. Now, if your mission is to find and destroy enemy tanks as a hunter-killer team, then you know what you gotta do. Enemy. What is their composition, disposition, and strength? What are their capabilities and limitations, and what is their most probable course of action? If I see a T-72 out all by its lonesome, I'm going to assume it's either broken down or is out of fuel. If the enemy is aware, meaning moving its turret and actively looking for targets, I'm going to assume that I have a greater threat than a complacent adversary that's standing outside of their tank smoking cigarettes. That 125mm gun on the T-72 can ruin my day. There is absolutely nothing on my vehicle that can stand up to that tank's main gun. I do not want a fair fight because I don't want to be turned into a ball of molten aluminum. Let's talk about terrain. This includes weather. Different kinds of weather have different effects on different sensors. If it's rainy, wet, and miserable, you can bet the adversary isn't as alert. They're huddled in their poncho, counting the minutes until their guard shift is over. Is the terrain to your advantage or to your adversary's advantage? Is there cover and concealment for you or your adversary? Do you have clear fields of fire? If the enemy decides to assault you, what is their most likely avenue of approach? The next T is troops available. What assets do you have for combat and support? You have to take into account readiness and levels of fatigue. 
In this case, where I just encountered a T72 and I'm in an IFV, that means I have three crew and seven dismounts. Uh, are they fatigued? Are they fresh? Are they new? Have they been operating as a crew for a while? Time. Time is probably the most rigid constraint. One thing the military teaches people is to be on time. If you've ever wondered why your veteran friend showed up 15 minutes early for a corporate meeting, it's because soldiers have this innate fear of ever being late for anything. If I am on my way someplace and I encounter a T-72, do I have enough time to engage that vehicle and still make it to where I'm supposed to be at the appropriate time? Finally, there's civilian considerations. That's the C part of Met-T, which is sometimes added on as Met-T-C. This isn't always covered in training because putting random civilian role players on the battlefield creates another logistical hurdle for the trainers. So that could undermine the intent of the training. So it's great to have civilian role players during a large scale exercise, but if you're learning how to do a squad attack, it's just going to get in the way of you learning how to do that squad attack. So normally we'd only have civilian considerations in a large brigade level exercise where they have fake uh, civilian role players on the battlefield. Now in this, you have to take into account the rules of engagement how you're going to deal with refugees and prisoners, any historical, cultural, or religious sites of significance that are off limits, and any non-governmental organizations or the media that are in the area. In this case, I'm not too worried about the media and I'm not too worried about civilians. I'm mainly worried about prisoners. What if this vehicle really is out of gas and once we start firing, the vehicle surrenders to us? How am I gonna deal with prisoners when I can only fit 10 Joes in my IFE? So let's try to come up with a scenario that is likely. Let's say that uh, me and my Bradley were fighting at the company level, we're fighting Denovian forces on the front line, and we came upon a wounded Atropian civilian during the fighting. There's no medevac assets available, so we're gonna have to casvac the civilian. This means we have to use one of our vehicles to evacuate the wounded. We also decided to take with us Private Schmuckatelli. He hurt his foot a couple of days ago. He's been acting like it's no big deal, but everyone can see he's sucking it up and the medic really wants him to get treatment. So we're gonna evacuate Private Schmuckatelli as well. My company commander orders me to do the Casivac since he knows I'm a scrounger. Our company hasn't had any hot chow in a few days. We're low on lubricant for the chain gun and he knows I'll sweet talk or steal what I need. The aid station's about 10 miles or 16 kilometers to our rear. Since I can only take seven Joes in the back of my Bradley, I take the platoon medic, the wounded civilian, and Private Schmuckatelli. I leave three of my Joes behind. The trip to battalion is uneventful. I drop off the medic, the civilian, and Private Schmuckatelli at the battalion aid station. The medic tells me it could be a while before Private Schmuckatelli is seen, so I set about stealing everything that isn't tied down. I sweet talk some chow and a mermite of coffee out of the Echo Company mess sergeant. I also get an entire tea rat cake for one soldier who has his 21st birthday tomorrow. Then I trade a Denovian helmet for some grease and I head back to the aid station to go get the medic. Private Schmuckatelli's foot is broken and he's not going anywhere, so we all pile back into the Bradley and head back to the front lines. I tap out a message on my Blue Force tracker. I tell the commander the situation with Private Schmuckatelli and that we're on our way back, ETA, about one hour. On my way back, the gunner spots a T-72 that wasn't there before. Crap. His T-72 is out in the field, there's no signs of crew, and the engine is still warm on our thermals. I give the order to hide behind a hill, haul down so that only our sensors and the tow launcher of the Bradley are sticking over the hill. Then I order the gunner to scan the wood line to see if there's any thermal signatures in the trees. If I were the crew of that broken down tank, that's where I would be. The gunner doesn't see any troops in the wood line, so that's good. It means that that crew has either left or they're still in the tank. So let's go over some of the scenarios this Twitter user suggested. Number one, skedaddle. This is an excellent idea, but if he sees me go down the road, I could get killed. It's a miracle he didn't see me when I was on the road the first time. Number two, lay optics and rangefinders on the turret. From where I am, I have a good shot at the side of the vehicle. The sable rounds of my chain gun can supposedly go through the armor on a T-72. They did in Iraq, but that was the export model, and I don't want to test this theory. Three, lay onto the tracks. The vehicle's already immobile. Maybe it's out of gas. The engine and the road wheels are still warm, but I don't see the engine running or the turret scanning. It could be broken down. Immediately, I think that this guy could be lost or he could be part of a group that is doing a flanking maneuver and his buddies are going straight for battalion, the place that I just came from. Now, I was moving faster because I'm on a road, but if he and his friends with him, odds are they're gonna be at battalion in a few minutes. Four, quietly spot artillery. 
Not a bad idea, but artillery isn't handed out like candy. It's more like a brigade level asset, at least in the US Army. You don't normally have artillery just hanging out waiting for some lowly platoon sergeant like me to call and ask for help, unless artillery has been physically allocated to you and your mission. Five, drop troops and engage end laws. The end law is a British weapon, so the odds of me having one are close to zero, and I am a thief. I'll freely admit that but I'm not so much of a thief that I would steal a weapon from a foreign country. It's also a very short range weapon, like 300-ish meters. We do have a javelin system on board my Bradley though, that can be dismounted. So step one is I call this up to my commander. Black Six, this is uh, Boardwalk Seven, message over. Boardwalk Seven, this is Black Six, send message over. I see one single T-72 grid, Echo, Golf, one, two, three, four, five, six. Engine off, no crew, no movement. Wheels are hot, it is facing west from Italian break. I can't tell a few thermals if there are other tracks, but he broke down his buddies that are probably headed to Italian, over. Copy, four, one, seven. Can you bite them? Six, if I move from behind this hill and he's alive, I'm gonna get schwacked. I think I can take him out, but Italian needs to be notified. Copy, seven. Let me know. Over. Roger, six out. Crap, shell's getting cold. All right, met T. Um, my mission is to get back to my company, but now that's changed. Enemy, my one T-72 whose engine is not running and the crew isn't near the vehicle. Terrain, uh, I have this hill as cover. The enemy is in the open, so that's good. Uh, troops, I got my Bradley and five Joes. Uh, the medic really isn't useful, but he can pull security. Time. I'm in no hurry to get back, but the chow is getting cold. Not really a thing I need to worry about right now. Civilians, not really applicable. Okay, here's the plan. Uh, I want four dismounts to grab a javelin and get out. Stay low and get about 100 meters to our right. Give me 360 degree security and lay the javelin on that tank. When I give the order over the radio, you launch that javelin at the tank. If it fails, we fire the tow. As soon as you shoot, you run back to the Bradley. If the tow fails, we fire a second tow and switch to chain gun. If that fails, we head back to the battalion. If you hit contact, you skedaddle back to the Brad. Don't try to be a hero. This plan could probably work, but if you have a better plan, let me know in the comments below. Hey, if you like my Hell in a Wire t-shirt, you can get your own at Bunker Branding. They have all sorts of fantastic Ryan McBeth t-shirts there. And thank you so much for watching. It's me, Captain Bannon of the documentary Team Yankee. When I'm not kicking commie butts, I'm wearing t-shirts from Ryan Macbeth available at Bunker Branding, Knife Hands, High Mars, Landmines, Patriot, and even my favorite, the Tow Missile. Mushna, we want t-shirt too. Take a hike, commie. So come on down to Bunker Branding and take a stand for what's really important about America, capitalism.